people here with varying perspectives, which is what we wanted. We've got students from SUNY Oneonta, we've got students from Harper College, we've got staff from both colleges, we have city officials, uh, we have uh, Barbara Ann Hegan representing the business community, uh, we have Heidi Bond representing the Otsego County Department of Health, and um, we've got uh, Peter Friedman, who is a former code enforcement officer and um, well-known citizen of the city of Oneonta. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for taking the time to be here tonight. Uh, all of your voices are very important during this very challenging time. You know, I came up with the idea of putting this group together nearly two months ago. And at that time, I thought that our mission would be to work together to generate ideas on how we could prevent getting where we are today. But this is where we are today. And um, now our mission is to move forward, curtail the spread that has started and be successful for the rest of this semester and the rest of the year. Given that we're in a different place than we thought we would be, I want to talk, change just today's format a little bit. I think right now, what is most needed is information. You know, I am, as I'm sure all of you are hearing from people during this past week who are concerned, who are frightened, who are confused as to what is happening. You know, the best antidote for fear is information. So today what I want to do in today's format is ask um, our Department of Health Director Heidi Bond to give us a little update of where we're at. I'm going to ask President Barbara Morris of SUNY Oneonta to give us an update of the status of the college and the plans going ahead for the future. And I'm going to ask President Margaret Dragovich of Harper College to do the same. Um, after each presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. So um, at that time, I'll ask people to raise their hand one at a time, be recognized. And um, each of the three presenters uh, will take your questions and answer them. Now, before we start, I just wanna say, we shouldn't be where we are today. And there will be many opportunities in the future as we go forward to look back, to analyze, to make judgments as to what we could have or should have done differently. But right now we have one task and that is to all come together as a community, as one with the same goal. And the goal is to protect the entire community, protect our students, protect our colleges, move forward with the current semester and the current year in a healthy and successful way. And we've taken on many challenges here in Oneonta before, and we've gotten through them all one way, and that was by all coming together. So what I ask now today is we do the same. We keep today's, con today's conversation constructive one. Uh, this is not a point a time for finger pointing or casting blame. This is a time for working together. And we need all of your heads together uh, in order to see a way forward uh, to be a place in a better place than we are now and a place where we all want to be. I'm gonna to try to keep the meeting not much more than one hour. So please keep that in mind as we go forward. And I look to have these meetings on a weekly basis for now. So we can, in, for, in future meetings, we can get more involved in talking about strategies and inputs and things we need to do. But today I wanna to focus on sharing information. So with that, I'm gonna start with um, Heidi Bond, who is the director of our County Department of Health. And Heidi, could you just give us a brief update um, as to where we are at, uh, whether it's the number of cases or the, number, or the plan for testing going forward or any other information that you have for us. Yep, yep. <clears throat> so to recap um, the outbreak, 
Um, it started a week ago tomorrow with um, two cases, and um, as you all know, exploded from there. Um, today, we had um, 85 cases reported in the county. Um, 83 of those were from um, our in SUNY students. One was a Hartwick student, and one was a community member. Um, so right now, we've had 304 cases reported to date um, from the beginning of the, um, the COVID um, pandemic. We currently have 177 active cases, and that means there's 177 people living in the county isolating with um, coronavirus. So they are isolating at home or at school um, alone so that they don't spread it to anybody else. Um, we are working really hard to make sure that we're contacting all of the cases, um, getting their contacts, and then um, putting them in quarantine so we can reduce the spread. As we've seen the spreads, this is a, a, a insidious virus and it spreads really, really quickly um, and fast. Um, so we're trying to get people into um, quarantine so that should they develop symptoms or become um, positive on test, that they're already quarantined and they don't have any more, uh, they're not exposing any more people. Um, so I think um, we've, we've gotten all the reports, um, the lab reports reported now from the testing that happened over the weekend at the school. Um, the state is setting up three testing sites in the city beginning on Wednesday, um, and those will be available for anybody who wishes to be, uh, community members who wish to be tested um, to go and, and get tested. And we encourage anyone who thinks they may have been exposed or, you know, just are uh, want to know what their status is to go and get tested. Thank you, Heidi. Before I open up to questions, I want to encourage as many people as possible to take advantage of the free rapid testing sites that will be in the city of Oneonta starting Wednesday. There are three locations, uh, St. James Church, Foothills Performing Arts Center, and the Armory on Academy Street. Besides, for your own peace of mind and knowledge of your own health, um, the data that we collect by having as many people tested as possible will tell us if how to what extent the virus contamination has spread from the student population to the general population. And that's important for us to know. So the more people that get tested, the better we know where we stand. Uh, okay, I wanna give an opportunity for anybody um, here who wants to ask questions of Heidi Bond. And I'm gonna, I wanna give the students the first opportunity to ask questions. So take the students first. Uh, Timothy. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, how's everyone doing today? Uh, I was wondering if uh, you would need any volunteers for the testing sites in town. Um, I can check with, um, with the State Department of Health. They may need some um, like flow monitors and um, possibly some parking assistance or traffic control, uh, traffic assistance. So I'll check into that. Anyone else on the students who have a question? Um, okay. I'll ask a question. Uh, hi, my name is Thomas. Um, are those sites that uh, the Cuomo is sending in, are those available for off-campus students or is that just for people that live in the town uh, full-time? So it's encouraged for the students to go to the testing that's happening on campus, which is opened up to off-campus students now, but you can certainly, there's no restriction. They're not gonna turn anybody away from those testing sites, but we do want to reserve those for the community um, because the off-campus students can be tested on campus. It sounds good, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel. I'm from Hartwick College. The question I have is, I know the state implemented the 5% and the 100 cases rule for the two week shutdown. Is that over a period of time or is that over the entire semester? So if cases slowly start to accumulate, um, does that mean active cases or cases in general? Um, how is that precisely being traced? 
I believe it's on a seven day rolling average. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, I will add to that, you know, my understanding is that at the end of the two weeks, the um, everything will be reevaluated by SUNY and the Department of Health and Partnership to determine where we're at and what the best way forward is. Yeah, if, if the outbreak is contained to the college and not, and we don't see community spread, um, they'll look at it as an isolated incident probably, and then it won't be, it won't affect the, you know, the region-wide numbers. Okay, right. If we have no other student questions, anybody else have questions for Heidi? Yes, I do. Um, who is uh, that? Uh, Diane, go ahead, Diane. Oh. Okay, Heidi, I have a question. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Diane Georgeson, the health officer for Oneonta. Um, do you have a sense, Heidi, in the last seven days, um, from all the testing sites, well now, your testing site, the schools, what your denominator is, and therefore what your um, positivity rate is? Um, including the school testing? Uh, probably around um, 1,800, maybe 2,000. It's probably more, but I'm not, I'm not certain because there's not a good way to calculate that because it's not all getting reported through the state system right now. Um, the rapid tests are occurring in the state, in the um, SUNY tests are occurring, but they're not it's not in one place where we can get that, grab that number easily. Got it. So maybe then that's a 10% positivity rate for the last week? Yeah. Out. Okay. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, and my question is, um, of the students that are uh, found, have been found to be infected, how many of them are residing in the downtown area, in, in the uh, off-campus area, uh, and how are they being monitored? Yep, um, there's probably about two thirds of the cases that are off-campus um, and a third on-campus. Um, both on and off-campus students who are positive and on isolation are being uh, monitored by the local health department um, by video chat daily. Um, so we contact them um, by video. They need to show us that they're home. Um, and we've um, also asked to partner with the city um, police department to help us do some random um, drive-by checks. So we're hoping to, to get that started soon. Thank you. David? Hi, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dave Risberger. I'm on the, the Common Council. Just a follow-up to what Peter's question was, Heidi. Um, considering how you're monitoring the students that are downtown that have tested positive and are quarantining and knowing the staffing levels of the County um, Department of Health and the workload that they're already under, um, how are you, how are they planning on being able to keep up with this? And uh, if they're, are they making contact daily or every other day? It just seems like an insurmountable task without looking for more assistance. Yeah, so um, it is daily. Um, it's daily monitoring. Um, today, I, I mean, today we did 105 um, isolation checks. Two people did it. Um, so we're, do, we're managing it. it. I mean, it's growing exponentially every day. So it's going to be to the point where we're going to have to reach out for assistance. But the state health, the state health department has offered us um, assistance. So we're leaning heavily on them um, and they've been great to offer um, help. Yeah, I expect you're going to have to reach out to them very soon. Yeah, yeah. We're in touch. We're in touch multiple times a day. So, yeah. Yes. Is that Emma? Yes. Hi. I'm a student at SUNY Oneonta um, and I have a question about the phrasing of SWAT team. Um, I know that that was not um, your choice of phrasing. I know that that's the state's choice, um, but particularly among the student body, I'm seeing um, all of the headlines that have picked up on that phrase being passed around 
And I know that that's inciting a lot of fear among the students since SWAT team stands for, you know, special weapons and tactics. And it conjures the image of police in riot gear who are heavily armed. Um, and I'm wondering if you can define right now and here um, what that truly means uh, so as to mitigate some of that fear. Sure. Um, to us, so that's a gov the, you know, that term comes out of the governor's office, um, but it really means a rapid response team um, made up of um, epidemiologists, nurses, um, practitioners, um, and uh, public health staff to respond rapidly to an event like this, um, to be able to um, stand up these testing sites very, very quickly and be able to test a, uh, you know, a good portion of the population in a short amount of time. So I would define it as a rapid response team. Okay. If there are no other questions, thank you, Heidi. We really appreciate you sharing this information with us. It's important that we are all hearing firsthand uh, where we're at right now. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to now, um, I want to thank President Barbara Morris from SUNY Oneonta for being here tonight and um, give her the opportunity to uh, present where SUNY is at right now and uh, the plans for moving forward. Barbara. Thank you, Gary. And um, thank you, Heidi, for all the work that you and your staff are doing. I know you work very closely with our staff um, and Melissa and you guys are a tag team um, pretty much and you have been from um, from the outset of this. So just uh, appreciate all the work. I, I have to say, you know, that not only um, the staff of our local Department of Health, um, but um, certainly OPD, the your staff, uh, Gary, uh, as well as our staff on campus. Um, I just have to really just praise everybody for working so diligently, um, so cooperatively, and um, just giving every effort um, to combat this. Um, obviously, it came on and is coming on fast and hard. And so, um, again, I just uh, I really want to praise everybody's working together um, even in the midst of, of kind of, of this crisis. Um, and, and do appreciate also um, both SUNY as well as the governor's uh, assistance. Um, so as this um, started, as Heidi stated, um, it really did arise out of um, what we can ascertain is a party that started on Saturday and the Monday before our classes started. And so that we do think that kind of the, the super spread event was a particular party, a particular event with student athletes and three um, athletic teams that had super spreaders amongst them that had invited some of our um, first year students into town. And then they came back onto campus. And as Heidi noted, it started on we started testing. Um, so our campus has PCR testing that we do on a daily basis. We can do 12 to 14 tests per day. And then um, we had always planned to start surveillance testing. So we had two types of surveillance. We had wastewater as well as our pooled um, surveillance through upstate medical. And so as, as Heidi mentioned, um, we started our PCR testing with symptomatic um, students on Monday. A Tuesday, um, a number of our students had started to go off campus, mainly to Well Now, but also a few to Bassett. And then the Well Now would do the rapid test, and so that they began to test positive. So we had our two positive cases on Tuesday. And certainly, as you can imagine, Almost a week later, we're over 200 cases. So it really just tells you how quickly this um, goes and how fast it spreads. And so what we were able to do was um, have Upstate Medical um, send us 3,000 tests. And so we began testing the students um, throughout the campus um, starting on Friday. And so the test results are coming in 
to date, we have done 2,160 tests and all but 187 students remain to be tested. And some of those students actually are no longer on campus. So we're um, near complete with our um, testing of our on-campus students. Obviously on Friday, we had about 300 plus tests and we've received those results. Saturday, we had another about 300 tests. We have received those results. On Sunday, we did over a thousand tests. And so you can imagine tomorrow, we're gonna have a ramp up and we're gonna have a, a likely a very big number. And then today we did over a thousand tests. So those numbers will come in and we will continue to test. We will actually start testing employees tomorrow and, and continue to um, do our off-campus students as well. Off-campus students are mandatory to be tested if they have taken a class on campus and we have about over 1300 students that take um, in-person classes, even though that 97% of our classes are online. And then any student that obviously lives on campus was mandatory and any student that uses our facilities. And so we have the card swipe access. And then we um, sent out a open call to all off-campus students to be tested. And so we do think that will capture um, the majority of, of off-campus students. The question has arisen whether it, we have to re mandatory require all students off campus and we cannot require legally a student that takes fully online or, and does not use our facilities. But we do think that's a small number and we do believe that um, the students are voluntarily coming up to be tested either on our campus or have already gone down to well now and are being tested there. And so, um, and or would elect to do one of the testing sites that start on Wednesday. And so that the testing protocol, protocol will continue and um, as, as we go on, but we do expect more cases. Diane, to your point about positivity rates, um, we're at 13 to 15% of our pooled population testing positive. Um, so that gives you some number of what we should expect. Um, with regards to our PCR tests, we've done 36 tests. Um, the lab that we uh, hired initially told us that it would be a two-day turnaround. And then um, most labs in New York um, were co-opted through the Defense Protection Act and, and all those tests were diverted elsewhere. So we're on day nine of many of our tests with regards to getting the results back. Um, out of the 36, I think we've got nine back thus far and four of them were positive. Um, so we're still waiting on a number of our PCR tests. The good news about those PCR um, tests, those students were symptomatic and we put them into quarantine immediately. So they've been tucked away and so not spreading. Um, the way our quarantine and isolation rooms are, um, we have quarantine rooms that then have a separate um, bedroom, bathroom, and um, food is delivered to them. And then we have um, the isolation rooms that um, can have students, once they've tested positive, you can have multiple students in um, more dorm style or um, suites. Um, and we have, we actually are taking another dorm offline um, so that we'll have plenty of space for the isolation rooms. Now that we're um, in quarantine in place um, based on the Department of Health and working with the State Department of Health as well as um, Heidi's office, of what are the protocols for what does it mean for students on campus. Um, the first thing to do is that the public health really did, has recommended that students um, stay in place and don't go home. As you can imagine, you know, parents um, are concerned about their children, whether they're in isolation or test positive or quarantine. So we've had a number of requests to be picked up. 
what we've stated is if they're waiting results of a test, we want them to get those results first so that any transfer back to um, wherever they live, they're um, following the correct protocol and then the, um, their county and local health departments would be notified. Um, we are again um, um, trying to keep the students on campus and have the, the parents and um, keep them quarantined in place. In the quarantine in place, um, food delivery has moved to um, dorm delivery. Um, we have had a number of concerns having to pivot that. Um, today's meals weren't all that cracked up to be. And so um, it will get better. Um, our dining service is contracting with another service for some meal delivery. So um, we'll have a, a better um, care of the meals um, starting actually tonight and uh, through tomorrow. And that will continue for the next 14 days. As Gary said, we're on pause for 14 days. So 97% of our classes are already online. So those 3% of, of classes will be converted through our academic continuity plans to online. Our faculty have been working on this and prepared to do so. Um, they've already started that as of today's classes. Um, the events that we had, we actually had um, limited our events um, to very few. We didn't have athletic events. We didn't have um, sports teams um, with formal practices and our, certainly our fitness centers weren't open. And so those events, those club events that um, our student development folks were, were organizing have been suspended for two weeks. As well as operationally, we've converted back to our low density telecommuting model with only essential employees coming onto campus. We already had restricted um, visitors onto campus into our facilities. We are a public institution and public space. So we can't um, board up the campus and not allow visitors onto the space. Um, so that I know that there's been some questions with regards to that. Um, other um, things that obviously we're doing is that when we get the information from the Department of Health with regards to those positive students, now we are um, taking, notifying those and we're um, calling them in person with our healthcare professionals because you can imagine the emotion of being told that you're positive. And so we have um, those healthcare professionals notifying them and then if they're on campus students, then our um, staff um, go to their room with full protective gear. So it's often scary as well um, to have someone, you know, call you and tell you you're positive and then someone show up at your dorm room in full protective gear and escort you to an isolation room. Um, again, where the isolation rooms are, um, there, um, the students can commingle because they all have tested positive. We are doing, um, we have check-ins with people that we have volunteers calling our students, both in quarantine as well in isolation. We do have separate quarantine rooms set up for those individuals that through the contact tracing has come in direct contact. So we have rooms set up for those and separately to kind of the quarantining in place that our students are doing. Again, all meals are being delivered to the dorms. The students per Department of Health that aren't in formal quarantine or isolation may um, get, go out and get some fresh air, but it's not to go play Frisbee or um, do massive exercise. It's really to take a walk and get some fresh air. Um, the monitors, so we have RA staff and other staff monitoring that. We have suspended bus um, transportation as well as taxis up into campus. Um, we continue to monitor as well as um, students that may have cars. Most of our 
um, our first year students as well as our sophomore students aren't allowed to bring cars to campus. Um, so we can monitor um, that traffic as well. Um, so we're doing monitoring. As far as off-campus students, as Heidi mentioned, they are those that are in isolation are being contacted via video. Those in, in quarantine are also being contacted um, sometimes through video, I would imagine, but oftentimes through text messages. Um, we do know that New York has offered um, up to, I think, 70 additional um, potential contact tracers to come in the area to help monitor. Um, additionally, we've had um, State Department of Health over the last weekend, and I worked closely with them to um, come up with this plan. The, there was a change, um, actually, literally, as we were kind of moving into um, this space of, of what the governor had said in New York pause. Since we were mainly already 97% um, with very limited activities, we were close to New York pause already. And so um, we were wondering about what is the best case for um, students, whether to keep them quarantined in place or send them home. And again, the, the latest in terms of public health is to quarantine them in place and not to send them home to um, have continue the spread. Um, with that, I think I'll let the, the questions if you have them, because I'm sure there's many. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, why don't we again allow the students to ask questions first? So if any of the students have questions, just raise your hand. Yes, Emma. Hi, Emma. Hi. Um, you mentioned how scary it would be for somebody to receive the call that they're positive and then to have um, people in full protective gear arrive to their dorm. Um, and I'm wondering what's being done in addition to, I know the campus is offering telecounseling appointments, um, both for students who have received a positive result, but also just the student population in general. Um, who is or quarantined on campus right now, uh, what's being done to help promote mental health, strong mental health? And, and so I'll let maybe Frank um, enter in um, so that he can talk about some other specifics, but certainly the, the telecounseling, the contact, um, having volunteers reach out to the students as well as kind of the, the physical, I think those contacts, making sure that there's contact and they have someone to talk to. We also have a care line. If they have any concerns, they can reach out to that care line and get the resources they need. Um, one of the things that I think um, hit us all by um, surprise is that obviously we had begun to have conversations about what we were gonna do with New York Pause. We had started those. I had started actually those on Thursday the governor's guidance came out Friday. Um, we had started planning. And again, I was on the phone with the New York State Department of Health about what to do in this situation, knowing that it was going so fast paced. And then um, the chancellor was coming to campus on Sunday. And um, with everybody else, I learned that we were closed at 1130, you know, by the, by the governor. And so then it was really working with my staff after the fact of how to logistically put this into place. And so we do plan to um, do, I do virtual chats with the campus, but do one with the students so that they can ask questions. But we really need to get our healthcare professionals and those people the, the time, because right now we're in the mode of, of making sure everybody's safe so once um, we get it to a point where um, we can actually have the people at the table to answer the questions that the students want, we'll do another virtual chat with them as well. But Frank, you wanna add into that a little bit more? Sure, Emma, we have a community care team that's assigned to all students that are being quarantined and isolated uh, to meet all of their uh, needs, both physical um, as well as material. Uh, also, each student is still um, have an RA and an RD that's assigned to them 
uh, that reach out to them while they're in quarantine. So although they may have moved to the quarantine hall, for example, if they're from Wilbur Hall, the RD in Wilbur will still reach out and contact them uh, and serve as a resource for them. We also have a drag and care check-in um, form that we ask students to uh, complete online if they have concerns, uh, whether they're mental health concerns or other concerns. Uh, and someone will reach out in response to uh, them using the drag and care check-in form uh, that's online that's available to students. We understand that students are in isolation uh, can become anxious uh, and we wanna make certain that they know that they are not alone uh, and that the resources that were available to them uh, in their mainstream residence hall still exist in those isolation and quarantine halls as well. Any other students with questions? Uh, I've uh, Julian. Hi, Dr. Morris. So my, my main position on campus is I'm the Intergree Council President and so far over the last week, I know we have had one organization suspended and two that are under interim suspension for hosting parties or events off campus that the majority of Greek life does not agree with at the moment. What I was wondering is, are the organizations such as the sports teams you mentioned in the original spreader event or a few other parties uh, hosted by different organizations on campus, whether those are clubs or off campus Greek life organizations that the school doesn't recognize, are those students going to be held to the same standard as the Greek life um, students are? Because it seems that while we're getting a we're getting blanket bans for things that some students are doing, the sports teams only got a couple kids suspended and there doesn't seem to be any further action against them. And I'll probably let um, Frank, because there are some differentiation with regards to the, the Greek organizations, but I, I will comment that the individuals that have hosted um, have been placed on interim suspension, which means that it's not just suspension of an organization. It means they're um, not in classes and in schools or that they also their residential contracts have been suspended. So it's actually even more so than just being suspended as an organization. But Frank, you want to um, add on to that? Sure. We uh, hold all student organizations to the same standard, uh, Thomas. Um, the um, pause on uh, recruitment and rush activities for uh, the fall semester uh, was done as a precautionary matter uh, so that we can contain the virus before it spread it as for, uh, further uh, and not have activities uh, for Greek life members um, uh, to have large gatherings um, that may cause the spread of, of the virus. Uh, the organization that was suspended uh, was suspended for violating the Greek code of conduct, that, which, which is also in violation of the student code of conduct. Uh, and they were not a first offender. Uh, so that's why they were suspended. Um, our pause relative to rush uh, and uh, recruitment activities um, is not considered a suspension, but a pause uh, so that we can reevaluate the situations uh, and make certain that our student organizations are providing the safest opportunities uh, to recruit new members. Thanks, Frank. Kevin, I think you had your hand up. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. For those who don't know me, I'm Kevin. I'm a senior at SUNY Oneonta. Um, President Morris, I just wanted to ask uh, if there was any clarification on a new threshold that we're trying to avoid, if there was a specific metric that if MED would definitively close the campus or if um, that has not been determined yet. Um, no, again, as I said, that the public health officials have designated that what we're doing is, is what we're doing. It could be that we're continually in this state for the rest of the semester. Hope is that you get out of this state, but that um, at this time, it would not be recommended that we close the campus and send students home. That is deemed as a more of a public health threat. And so... The idea is that you essentially quarantine in place. Um, but the, uh, what we'll be looking at is that if we can obviously contain it um, to the, the student body, to contain it and to stop the, the heightened um, numbers. And so as we move forward, that, that's the goal. But we do expect over the next two days 
um, three days to get, you know, increased numbers. Thus far, we have no employees that have tested positive. So that's a good sign. In our wastewater and our sewer water detection, which actually has a high sensitivity rate and detects kind of pre any um, other indications, um, it's still located in the residential dorms and has not gone over into administrative and other space. We are checking that on a regular basis so that there wouldn't be another, it's basically that you're looking for it to, to where we can unpause in a graduated way, you know, by allowing some, you know, less restrictive going back to the dining halls. Um, that would be the first thing we would want to be able for students to do. Hi. Nem? Yes, Maham, is that correct? Maham. Yes, it's Maham. Hi, I'm a sophomore at SUNY Oneonta, and I just had a question regarding the um, meal situation and how like they're being delivered to students. Um, will there be a partial reduction in the meal plan costs for all students in response to the changes in the dining plans? Because I know that's like a big concern within the student body right now. Right now, um, we'll have to work with Sodexo on that with regards to you know, how long the pause is. And um, they, they understand that today um, was not a good day for meals and they are working and, and heard the students loud and clear and want to make sure that the, the meals are delivered by Department of Health um, code and the concern for obviously COVID and then foodborne, um, any illnesses from foodborne, it is that the, there's a certain limitation of what those um, meals can be. And that's, you know, certainly unfortunate and there's not the meal choice that, you know, US students are, are used to. So again, that's something that we'll look to in the future. We have been, um, we will be for those students that decide that um, it's too much, they're too afraid and they want to leave campus that we will be working on prorated refunds for room and board for those students. In, in the interest of time, let's open it up to um, everybody else with questions. I, we want, I want to give um, President Dragovich enough time to speak as well. So um, Dave Risberger. Yes, hi. Um, considering the ward that I represent is, uh, it, it's about 50, 50, 50% 50 um, non-student, 50% student. And looking at the numbers, the high number of, of off-campus students that are quarantining and we don't know where they live. Um, I, I was, my question is kind of two part. Number one, what support are you giving these students that are quarantining off campus? I've heard what you're doing for the on-campus students, but what, are, what, what support are you giving the off-campus students? Are you planning on helping the Department of Health out? And then the second part of this is since there's a high level of fear of community spread, um, not only in my ward, but throughout the city, um, what are you doing to change the uh, density levels of employees that are currently working on the SUNY campus? Because many of them live within the city. So the density, so we went to um, remote operations as well. So starting today, today is Monday, right? Um, so um, starting today, um, the bulk of our employees are telecommuting. So they're at home working and it's only essential employees and, and volunteers. Obviously we need a, a number of volunteers on, on campus to continue the, the testing protocols as we move forward. But the most of our employees are telecommuting. So that, that answers that question. With regards to our off-campus students, those in quarantine and isolation have the same continuity of care that Frank uh, mentioned with regards to interactions with our staff and telecommuting. Um, they have the options, the availability of telecounseling, telehealth, and um, engagement activities that all of our students have um, on campus. Um, so it's not just campus students. Obviously they don't have the RA, but they have um, care lines and we have volunteers um, to con contact them 
as, as they need. With regards to um, the work of monitoring that is Department of Health and, and we're not part of the monitoring uh, of the students. I, I understand that just as a follow-up, um, but I know that OPD is planning on assisting and they're not employees of the Department of Health. So the, the reason I asked is would you or some of your staff be willing to assist as well with the monitoring? Because it's, it's a lot of students. Um, again, we're, we're again contacting them through our volunteering, but Frank, do you have any other additional as far as what your staffs are contacting our um, off-campus uh, students? Again, our Dragon Care uh, 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 contact form is available for our off-campus students, and we've shared that with them uh, through emails and asked that if they have some concerns or, or needs that they uh, complete those forms so that we can um, get the proper resources to them. Uh, as Dr. Morris indicated, we have several uh, faculty and staff members who are volunteering to serve on that Dragon Care team uh, so that we can uh, reach as many of our off-campus students uh, who may have some needs uh, to try to provide those resources to them. Any other questions, Diane? Um, quick comment, then a question. First comment is that the city of Oneonta um, has also been checking its wastewater and from the 28th, we did see a slight increase. So I think there is some evidence of community spread. Um, that was my comment. My question is, are any of the two thirds of the, pay, the um, students who were positive that were residing off campus, um, are they isolating on campus? And do you have a, a sense of a number that are actually isolating in the city? Um, I do have, we have those numbers as we get them. We know where the students, where they're there. A number of our students are actually have gone home. So wherever home, home, even our off-campus students have gone home, whether they're isolating or quarantined because the Department of Health will contact the student to ensure that they have the proper facility um, to be able to quarantine or isolate. So we do know that students have elected to go home. We've had had some students that are off campus that if they couldn't um, quarantine or isolate in their um, apartment, um, then they have been able to come onto campus. Um, with the numbers that we have now, I mean, we're talking now in the, the hundreds, I don't think it's a two thirds. I think now the, the population is, is more on our, our campus than off campus right now. It's in the dormitories. So that what we're gonna see is the spread in the dormitories. I think that we've um, probably seen, um, had the height of the off campus, but right now I, I haven't seen the numbers um, for the last two days, which uh, you know we've had the 80 cases in the last two days. We're waiting to actually input all that information. So we'll, we'll have a better sense. And uh, one of the um, hiccups, and I'm sure Heidi says this as well, is that you know getting the information um, from the variety of test sites, um, getting that um, kind of, um, getting that into a form. And I know SUNY's working, trying to get uh, a way that we can get the information in a timely, and in a way that we don't have to keep um, inputting it manually um, because manual input takes time and effort and then to manually count and to figure out where everyone is, um, is tremendous. So I think that's where we've been asking for assistance from both the Department of Health as well as SUNY um, to help um, with that logistical information to get more at the detail of the where this you know we know where the students are but that we can pinpoint more exactly with the numbers and the percentages yeah I th if i can just jump in it's heidi i think um uh, you know once we get past this initial testing and know who's positive um and who is quarantining we'll be able to figure out not we have a sense of where they are i mean we know where they are but we don't have a whole, uh, you know, global look at, at who's, how many are here and are there. But um, like Dr. Morris said, I think we're gonna see 
for now, the on-campus student um, numbers rise until we test more of the off-campus students and then it might even out again, but yeah. Peter. Um, fraternities and sororities and athletic teams uh, have a past record of uh, breaking city regulations with regard to gatherings for many years. And uh, it, it seems like it's very difficult to get them to stop doing things that you don't want them to do. So uh, what steps have you taken with regard to notifications to the different organizations and have those notifications, for example, been to the officers or to all of the members or what, what's been done? And are you confident with what's been done that it will have a deterrent effect? Um, Frank, you wanna talk about the, all the sanctions that have been both on athletics as well. I mean, Thomas talked about the suspension, but go ahead. Certainly, I, I can't speak to um, uh, the past behavior that, that you referenced uh, without actually uh, looking at data uh, to indicate uh, support for, for those claims. But I can say that if a student or a student organization uh, is in violation of city ordinances um, and they are ticketed or arrested uh, by OPD, uh, OPD will then share that with our Office of Community Standards uh, and we adjudicate those issues. Um, all of our students are afforded due process. Uh, however, if they are alleged to have violated city ordinances uh, that is also a violation of our students' code of conduct, uh, and we can hold them responsible on campus for those violations, uh, and we do so uh, regularly. Uh, yes, we have met uh, with those affinity groups that you mentioned. In fact, I've met with them personally. Uh, we held uh, uh, virtual town hall meetings with the executive uh, leadership of the uh, Greek Council on campus, uh, as well as we have met with the uh, student leadership of our athletic departments. Uh, so they are very aware of our expectations and they're very aware of what uh, ramifications they may face uh, if in fact they violate uh, city ordinances or violate our student code of conduct. Thank you. Let's have one, let's have one or two more questions so we can get to um, President Dragovich. Roxanne. Um, hi, for those who don't know me, I'm Roxanne, a senior at Hartwood College, um, and I kind of have two questions, so I'll just try to bunch them into one. The first question is, why weren't students and staff, um, students and faculty not required to get testing before arriving to campus, and how do you plan to sustain testing once the state funding leaves? Um, so we were following the, the science, um, best science uh, at the time, and I think would continue to be is that um, uh, according to um, Upstate Medical and our SUNY, SUNY scientist is that um, the concern with having a negative test coming in prior, it's a one stop, not sure where those tests are coming from. If it was a rapid test, there's a high faults um, and high faults if you're asymptomatic. And so the reliability of those tests um, give a false sense of security and that uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, once you've had that test that you can be positive within 24 hours. And so the, the best course of action is to actually isolate. And so we had isolate for seven days prior to coming to campus. For anybody coming from out of state, it was 14 days. So we opened up our dorms on August 10th. Um, as well as for any international students. And then the course of action after coming after isolation is to have surveillance. We have state-of-the-art wastewater surveillance as well as the surveillance, the pool testing. So the pool testing, if, it, if everything had gone you know, the way we would have wanted to rather than having a super spreader event, which was an, you know, obviously an unfortunate confluence of factors, but that when they would come, that the surveillance is wastewater, you would see an uptick, you would do surveillance in those areas, and then you would do continual testing. 
So we have that in place and we'll continue that as we, as we move forward. And we actually have the resources um, from SUNY as well as the state of New York to help us through that, that we do believe that once we get through this crisis that our surveillance um, is the best practices um, as we move forward. And I think you might've had another question, but I might've lost it. Um, the second question was, how do you plan on to, how do you plan on sustaining funding for testing once the state leaves? So we already have the surveillance testing in, in place. So we've already had that funded and we already have the wastewater going forward. Okay, um, let's take one more question. Have, um, if, let me first give a chance to somebody who hasn't asked any questions yet. Is there any, none? Okay, go ahead, Emma. Um, my question is about a reporting system. Um, about two weeks ago, I had recommended to the Office of Community Standards that a reporting system be established on campus. And unfortunately, I didn't hear back about that. Since then, I've done a bit of digging and I noticed, um, Mayor Hersick, that you established a tip line in town. Um, and I, as far as I know, that tip line, that number was not um, distributed to students. Um, so my question is, um, how can a reporting system be established within the campus? Um, because I think that would be particularly useful. Um, and in the meantime, when, how will that number be distributed, that tip line number be distributed to the student body? So um, Frank, there is a, a, a number on the student development page. There's two kinds of different forms. So there is a, a tip line on the student development for students peer to peer as well as there's a care line. So, um, so your suggestion was taken and um, it, it does exist. Will that um, information be distributed to students? Um, I know that not everybody necessarily visit is, visits that webpage. Um, so will there be an email sent with that information? Uh, there was an email sent with that information as well. Uh, there's actually an incident report form that's on the community standards webpage that uh, anyone can complete uh, that they would like to report an incident, uh, whether it's COVID related or not, uh, the Office of Community Standards will then institute an investigation. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, President Morris. We appreciate um, the update and all the information. Uh, I'm sure that all the people listening um, uh, appreciate hearing um, firsthand what is happening on campus. So thank you. Um, okay, I want to now turn it to um, President Margaret Drugovich of Harper College. Margaret. Thanks a lot, Gary. Um, I want to thank you and all of your staff at the city. I also want to thank the Department of Health uh, for working so closely with our director of our Perel Health Center. Heidi, thank you so much uh, for supporting Amy. So I know that the hour is drawn late and I'm going to therefore give a, a somewhat brief report of where we are. So we established and filed the reopening plan that the state requested uh, with following all the guidance for the, that was provided to us by the state and federal guidelines. Uh, we continue to make changes to that plan almost on a weekly basis as circumstances require. So all of the members of our community were required to sign a social compact that indicated that they understood their responsibilities to be members of our community. And unless they signed that compact, they were not able to come back to campus, nor were they able to come to work. And that compact required uh, their compliance with six foot social distancing, wearing a face covering at all times, including when they're outside on our campus, practicing good hygiene, disinfection of their spaces, and also daily symptom screening, including temperature checks. With regard to testing, uh, we put into place what we think is a very good uh, testing system. Every non-remote learner needed to bring evidence of a negative test result uh, upon their arrival to campus. And that was the SARS-CoV-2 PCR test. They needed to surrender those results to us. We were glad that we did that. We were able to pick up a couple of students who uh, presented or ended up having, but didn't come to campus, uh, positive tests uh, before their arrival. So we were pleased that we put that into place. That so was very helpful. Uh, every now, now uh, every non-remote uh, student learner and every employee were tested 
uh, with the nasopharyngeal PCR test this past week or early now this week, we contracted with WellNow to provide that testing. We've completed 1,200 of those tests as of today. That testing uh, is on our campus. Every student and employee will now be tested with the nasopharyngeal PCR every other week, starting this week throughout the rest of the semester. Uh, students who are symptomatic and need rapid testing, of course, we're working with the Department of Health on those uh, students and they're getting the testing, the additional testing that they need and we'll continue to work closely with the Department of Health. Uh, so we started very controlled, very slow uh, move in of our students on August 22nd and we continued that through this weekend. We sl have slightly over 900 students who are currently residents on our campus at this time. Uh, they, our students are required to live on our campus unless they get express permission to live off. So as a result, uh, we have very few commuters. As of this hour, we have 75 students who are in quarantine in their residence. Now about half of those students are students we expected to be in quarantine. So 21 of them, are from hot states, are still on, they've arrived from a state that was identified by the state as a hot state. Uh, two of them are roommates of students from hot states, and so they have to quarantine as well. Six are international students. Uh, seven are students who are awaiting their test results. So they took the test as they needed to before they arrived, but because of the testing situation and how much it varies across the regions that our students come from, not all of their test results were available, so they went directly into quarantine. Um, and that totals 37 uh, students in quarantine for reasons that we had anticipated. So none of that was a surprise to us. Over the weekend, as the situation developed in the city, we asked students to step forward if they had had contact with a member of the SUNY Oneonta community. We've now, uh, as a result of that, placed another 38 students who had contact uh, with a SUNY Oneana student, either directly or indirectly, or their roommate had contact with a SUNY Oneonta community member. We have now placed those additional 38 students in quarantine. Our plan is to have all of our Hartwick members who are in quarantine retested. At this hour, we have one student who has tested positive for COVID. We do believe that this student was exposed to the virus through an activity that occurred off campus. Uh, this particular student is isolating at her home outside of the city. Uh, earlier today, and I appreciated the initiative uh, shown here by the Department of Health, uh, they contacted us and they made a suggestion that we issue a statement to all of our students asking them to refrain from contact with members of the SUNY Oneonta community. And we have done that. We have also reminded them of their responsibility to social distance and to wear masks at all, in all public spaces, both on our campus and off. We also asked them to remain on campus unless it was absolutely necessary that they leave camp campus. And uh, we're going to monitor that and uh, do our best to remind students that that is very important. Uh, also with regard to campus access, and you might have seen this in the news, late last week we announced that until further notice, only some individuals will be able to enter our campus. So our campus is effectively now closed to the public. Uh, we were having some problems at our entry points uh, with individuals who weren't respecting the rules that we had in place. So at this time, only Hartwick College residents employees, bona fide commuter students, not remote students, but commuter students, uh, uh, scheduled and approved visitors, people making regularly scheduled deliveries, uh, or those who must receive authorization from the vice president, a vice president, or the chief human resource officer. Those are the only individuals who are allowed to come to our campus. Uh, we now have sentries at our entrances 24 hours a day. Uh, just one last note about our classes. About, uh, we just started class today. About 75% of our classes are being done in person as we had planned or through hybrid. And what that means is that 
the class is in a socially distanced class. And so, you know, uh, we have a reduced density in our classrooms. If a student's not feeling well or something else comes up, they can uh, remote into that class and all of our classes will operate that way this semester. Uh, and the remainder of our class, about 25% are intentionally remote. We also have 200 students who have chosen not to come to campus this fall. We gave them that uh, choice. They are studying completely remotely. And so no matter what their course schedule is, they can access all of their courses remotely as well. So uh, we are monitoring the situation daily and we're making adjustments daily. We have a terrific uh, strategic response team that we've been working with since very early in March. They've been uh, terrific. Our community has been very supportive. They want our students to be able to get the education that they're here to get. Our students are very happy uh, to be back. They are, I watch them out my window. Uh, they are by far complying with our requirements and those that don't uh, will be held accountable. Uh, we did as a result of some activity uh, this weekend, we did um, put three students, uh, Harvard students on administrative leave. Uh, they made the unfortunate choice to host a party within the city. Uh, there was no social distancing. Uh, there were no face coverings. They basically broke the terms of their social contract. So they are off campus, uh, but moreover, they are not allowed to enroll in their classes this fall. So they are effectively suspended from participating in our community, including our coursework. So uh, we'll continue to enforce the terms of the social compact and when and if, and I hope not, but when and if students uh, break those terms, we will act accordingly and we're prepared to do that. So I think uh, given the hour, I'll stop uh, with my update there. And if anybody has any questions, I'm glad to take them. Dave? Yes, thank you. Um, Margaret, I don't actually have a question. It's more of a quick statement for you. Um, I just wanna thank you for everything that Hartwick has done. I think um, your plan was very proactive, um, requiring the students to show negative test results before they came back on campus. And I, I really truly think that was the way to go. I know there's a chance of, of uh, false negatives, but I think um, what you did is better than um, not doing any testing. So thank you. Barbara Ann. Thank you, Mayor Herzeg. Thank you, President Drugovich and President Morris. The question that I have from the community is, will the students be retested again? And if so, what is the time frame for that? And the off-campus students, particularly I know more so Suny Oneonta off-campus, I know you mentioned that it might not be legal for all of them to be tested. Um, could you go into a little bit more about that? And does the chancellor have any oversight to mandate even off-campus students to be tested? Hi, to me, I think um, Margaret probably can answer. I think they're getting tested every other week, Margaret is. That's, That's right. correct at the PCR test, which is That's the right. gold standard of testing. Um, our um, students with regards to um, once, obviously we're testing all the students and, and as we move forward, as well as our employees um, through the pool testing, and then we'll move to uh, regular surveillance pool testing. With regards to mandating students, if a student does not, if they're fully online, and they do not access any facilities, um, there is no legal um, mandate to have them be tested. Certainly we encourage them to be tested, um, whether through our pool testing or through the rapid tests that um, are available either at local providers or when um, the state comes in with the three um, free testing sites. And just a reminder of the three testing sites, there is an appointment line that um, you have to call to make an appointment. You can't just show up to get those um, tests. Thank you. Thank you both for answering my question. Appreciate it. Okay, let's take two more questions. 
Julian? Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Julian. I'm a student here at Hartwick College. And um, I just wanted to give the Hartwick student perspective on how everything's been going on campus. And I just wanted to say that a lot of statutes that we have in place have been working really well. I know we've mentioned the bi-weekly testing for all students on campus that are either taking a mixture between hybrid classes or all online classes. That's been something really great. It's been reassuring, especially to people on my floor building and campus that we know that while well, we might've been tested this week and since we've only had one kid, that doesn't mean in November, other kids are still in danger of getting it because it's only like 13% to 15%, there's still an 85% danger just from one person possibly having it that can get infected. So that's been great. And then um, the Campus Clear app too has been a really positive push. I'm not sure if um, SUNY Oneana has something like this too, but Hartwick is required every day. When I wake up, I have an alarm that says, how are you feeling today? Do you have any symptoms before I'm able to go out and do classes? It's things like that that like ensure that when I leave with a face mask on, that I feel safe and the people who are my neighbors and across campus feel safe too. So uh, thank you. Thank you, And we do have that uh, check on day, all employees and students do the daily check-in as well as they affirmed a, a similar contract um, that Hartwick students did. Right, good. One more question. Anybody? Okay, um, Barbara Ann? About communication to the general community, how best can the community be informed on what is happening both on SUNY Oneonta campus at Hartwick? Because there's conflicting numbers. Uh, there was a press release that went out from SUNY Oneonta that stated a lesser amount of students today today that was tested positive. And then the county uh, health department came out with different numbers. So how could we make sure that we're all on the same page? Um, so again, the numbers, and as Heidi will attest, is, is numbers come in um, throughout the day and night. And so we have to pick a, a particular time. Um, we try to get those communications out um, by the close of business. But obviously, if something's happening, we, we're but that's our goal. And then we update our um, dashboard um, every morning. But it, it will be dynamic because obviously the Department of Health will make a public uh, you know, announcement or a press release. That'll be after our moment of where we've had to communicate. So it, it's gonna be um, revolving. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Before we close, I just wanna say primarily to the students who are here and, and to relay it to all of the students. Um, we all know that the over overwhelming majority of the students who are here are doing the right thing. They're here for their education and you are actually being hurt more than anybody by um, the re what's happened the past week. So um, we recognize that. And um, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes being a college student in 2020. So we know that uh, this has been very difficult for all of you. Uh, I want you also to know that, um, you know, we are one Oneonta, uh, Hartwick students, our SUNY students, the people who live here year round, we're one community and um, we welcome you. We're glad you're here and we can work together. The only way we're going to get through this is to all work together. I wanna to thank you all for your time today. I know we didn't have a lot of opportunity to share ideas, but I think you did a big service to the community today by giving them an opportunity to hear firsthand um, what is happening on the campuses and uh, what we're doing and where we're going. So we will continue these meetings on Mondays as long as we feel that they're useful. Uh, so um, thank you to everybody. I do really appreciate you being here and being part of this. And good night all and, um, and to the students, you know, best wishes with your studies under these very difficult circumstances. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much.